Oh, it makes him sad to see the way we live. He'll always say, I forgive. Good evening, family, and welcome to our Wednesday night summer series. Nathan Ward will be our speaker again tonight. He's going to continue his three-part series from the book of Esther, and we appreciate Nathan so much for all his time and his efforts in presenting these lessons to us. Before I turn you over to Nathan, I would like to give you an update of our plans for this Sunday. We're going to return to the building uh, everyone has seen the survey, and we appreciate so much all who have responded. And so the plan is to return to the building for those that are willing to come this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So we will meet at 10 a.m. And everyone who said that they're comfortable with coming back to the building and understanding the guidelines that will be in place, everyone who said they're comfortable is welcome to come back. We have 75 people at this time who are willing to come back. A few will be out of town uh, this weekend, so we're not expecting a large crowd at all, and that's okay. We're just trying to get a grip on how we're going to move everyone in safely and out safely. So we'll have some deacons here helping folks understand kind of the lay of the land. We're going to encourage you and all the family members in your family that are participating to please wear a mask. If you forget your mask, we have some uh, mask here at the building, and so we can share one with you. We would also ask that you bring your own Lord's Supper emblems. But again, if for some reason you cannot or you forget, we will have some emblems available for you when you get here. We're going to social distance. Uh, throughout the auditorium. And so if there's only around 70 of us, 75, we'll have plenty of room uh, to spread out in the auditorium. Expect the service uh, to last about one hour, and, and then we'll let everyone exit safely. So we'll have a few other guidelines that you'll see when we send out an email, and more than likely you've received that email by now of just some guidelines that are going to be in place. We want everyone to come in and out the front door. And so we just appreciate so much your patience with us as we try to navigate uh, these unusual waters. Lord willing, we will be able to proceed safely and everything will go well this Sunday so that we can open up this crowd uh, to even more who are willing to come and maybe even release some of these restrictions uh, that we have in place or not be quite as strict. We'll just have to see about that. But again, thank you so much for your cooperation. I will say, I will say that there was an overwhelming majority of our family in Christ that just isn't comfortable coming back yet, regardless of the restrictions. And we get that. We understand that. And so we don't want folks feeling pressure or feeling guilty uh, for not coming back. We will continue uh, the virtual assemblies. Those will continue regardless. And so we'll have a virtual assembly this coming Sunday, as well as an assembly here at the building for those that are willing to come back. So just wanted to give you an update, but thank you. Thank you so much for all your patience, your kindness, and your humility uh, in this matter. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll let Nathan speak to us from the book of Esther. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for all your love and your care. And thank you, dear Lord, for even all the grace that we can see in the world around us, even at a challenging time like this. And help us to keep our eyes open to all the goodness. There's definitely, definitely a lot of issues in the world right now. A lot of challenges, a lot of evil. But at the same time, dear Lord, there's a lot of good. And may that good also be seen in all of us. We thank you for our church family, and we pray, dear Lord, that you'll bless each and every member of this family in Christ. We thank you for our brother Nathan, and we thank you so much for his time and energy. Open up our minds and our hearts. 
to what your spirit has to say to us through this wonderful story of Esther. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you. Enjoy the lesson. Well, this is our second lesson on the book of Esther, and this time we're going to talk about whether or not Esther is religious, which might seem like a really strange question to be asking of a book that is in the Bible. Uh, but there is reason that that question comes up, and there have been some pretty uh, strong responses against the book of Esther. I'll share some of those with you in a little bit. And I think we need to be able to have some reasonable way of, of answering uh, this question of whether Esther is religious. And what's great is the way that I would propose to do that also gives you insight into other things that are going on in the book of Esther. And so I think this is kind of a, a multifaceted sort of, of tool to help you understand a lot of what's going on here uh, in this book. So uh, why the question is, is the first thing. Why would someone ask if a book of the Bible is religious. Uh, and as we talked about last time, and again, as, as I presume you know already, this is one of the bits of trivia that everyone knows about the book of Esther, is that God is not mentioned in the book. But it goes deeper than that, because not only is God not mentioned in the book, nothing else religious is mentioned in the book either. There's no mention of God. There's no mention of the promised land. There's no mention of the city of Jerusalem in particular or the temple specifically. There's no mention of the law or the covenant or the promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, or to David. There's no mention of Sabbath. There's no mention of circumcision or any of the feast days, including Passover, which is significant because the day that Haman writes his edict in chapter 3 is the day before Passover begins. But Passover is not mentioned. There's no reference to a, a a coming Messiah, uh, but there's no religious activity either. No one prays, no one prophesies, no one has vision, no one performs a miracle. There's no focus on purity, even though there's a really good spot for there to be a focus on purity in chapter two. There's no focus on righteousness or godliness or holiness. There's no focus on dietary laws, even though Esther's being given the king's food, uh, even as Daniel and his friends were in Daniel chapter one. It's not set in Israel. It's not set in Judah. It's not set in Samaria or Jerusalem. It's set in Susa, the capital of the Persian homeland, which is significant because that means they did not go home. This is after the decree of Cyrus that set the exiles free. And all the good, strong people of faith, uh, maybe or maybe not, but that would perhaps be the indication. They all went home to start working on the city of Jerusalem and the temple and the walls uh, in the, the times of Zerubbabel and, and Ezra and Nehemiah. But these Jews stayed behind and they were pretty well integrated there into the city of Susa as well. They both have a pagan name, uh, which may or may not be significant, but Mordecai is related to the Babylonian god Marduk, the chief god of the pantheon. Esther is related uh, by name, by meaning of name, to the goddess Ishtar, who is the goddess of love and war, which is really pretty appropriate when you stop and think about Esther and what she does uh, in the book. Uh, Esther is married to a pagan king, and you think of foreign marriage in a broader biblical context, a broader Old Testament context, I mean, and in particular in the post-exilic context, foreign marriage was not smiled upon uh, at all during this time period. There's also questions of the motives of Esther and Mordecai. And here you read between the lines one way or the other because the narrator never tells us anything about their motives. Uh, Esther was brought into this contest. Was she willing or unwilling? Was she aghast at the whole thing? Or did she think it was a pretty good opportunity? Or is it somewhere in between? When she hides her Jewish identity at the command of Mordecai, is that a justifiable thing for her to do? Or was it not a justifiable thing for her to do? Uh, as she is defiled in chapter two, both with pagan food and with sex to a pagan king, uh, is that uh, defensible in some way or is it not? Uh, when she refuses or when Mordecai refuses to honor Haman, is that some sort of righteous defiance or is, is it not? I mean, uh, Jews bow to people all the time in the Old Testament, as long as it's not an idolatrous bow of some kind. There's, there's nothing wrong with the act of showing honor to someone. Is more, was Haman asking for something more, or was Mordecai just being stubborn? Um, what exactly is going on there? When Esther asks for a second day of killing there in the city, is that justifiable? Uh, is that self-defense, or is that just vengeance on the enemies? There's all kinds of these questions regarding their motives that we just don't know the answer to. 
Now, if you're anything like most Christians, we presume the best of them. And there's nothing wrong with presuming the best of them, except that not every Bible character should have the best presumed about them, especially at the beginning of their story. One of the great realities of Bible heroes is that they're imperfect. That They start very often in very bad places and grow to be someone uh, who is far greater than who they began as. It's one of the reasons why you can read the Bible and I can read the Bible and not walk away completely depressed uh, that we can't have any hope of living up to them because Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are all liars because David is an adulterer and a murderer. And that doesn't justify that kind of behavior, but it tells you that if people that behave like this can be great people of faith by the end of their life, then, hey, maybe there's hope for me, too. And so for whatever reason, I've run into people that just don't want at all to to even begin to think that Esther or Mordecai could be doing anything bad. The reality is we just don't know. Now, some people read them in the most negative way possible. Some people read them in the most Pollyanna positive way possible. The truth is probably somewhere in between, uh, and it varies from each of those different kinds of, of questions in those different circumstances. Some of it may have been more justifiable. Some of it may have been less justifiable. We don't know, uh, but it raises questions. You take God out of the story. You take everything religious out of the story. You have these people. I mean, if, if, if you're telling this exact same story and it's, you know, Bob and Mary in America, um, I don't know that you presume it's a Bible story because it is that irreligious on the surface of it, at least. And so what have people done with this? What have people done with the absence of God, the absence of religion, the presence of war, of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people being slaughtered uh, at the command of Esther, uh, these unknown motives? Well, historically, all sorts of different things have happened. Uh, if you go all the way back to the very beginning of interpretation of the book of Esther, what you find is people were struggling with these questions. And so in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they just changed the story. Uh, the Septuagint is significantly longer than the Hebrew text because they add God to the story. They explain why Mordecai doesn't bow. There are prayers that they speak that are given to you word for word in the Septuagint. They just added stuff to the story because apparently they couldn't deal with it uh, as it was. The same thing happens in ancient Jewish translations or interpretations, I should say. Uh, the, the ancient Jewish interpreters, whether whether it's the, the, the Targumim, these Aramaic translations and interpretations, or Josephus, if you read Josephus' version of the book of Esther, uh, again, what you find is God is added to the story. As you move forward into the Christian era, this group of early Christian writers who were called the Church Fathers, I don't know if you like that terminology or hate it, I use it because it's simple, that's what people call them, uh, this group of people called the Church Fathers, they basically ignore it. Uh, they don't talk about Esther really at all. For what it's worth, that's apparently what the Dead Sea Scrolls community did too. It's they have You found basically every Old Testament book in Qumran uh, except the book of Esther. Their religious calendars did not have the Feast of Purim on it, uh, the feast that, that grows out of the book of Esther. So there's a lot of ignoring it that goes on too because people just aren't sure what to do with it. If you look at various reformers during the period of the Protestant Reformation, uh, they are either ignoring it like the church fathers did or they are expressing their distaste for it. Um, as a whole bunch of people we'll talk about in just a moment do. And if you talk about what most churches do, again, at least in my experience, and obviously my experience is limited, um, in my experience as an adult, I should say, um, it's a little different when you're a child. You get the book of Esther taught to you, at least in some regard, but even then it's very much sanitized version of the story where you read about a beauty contest in chapter two that's not really a beauty contest. Um, but... Uh, as you move into adult teaching, one of two things happen with it. Uh, a lot of churches just ignore it. It doesn't get taught unless you happen to be female, in which case the ladies' Bible class will cover it because, you know, that's why Esther and Ruth are in the Bible is for women to study. Um, well, obviously, that's sarcastic if you didn't pick that up. Um, but uh, it doesn't get taught a lot. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the last lesson. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of sermons preached about it. And when they are, it tends to be just a one shot sermon on providence. And that's about as far as you get. Uh, and then what you do with it when you talk about it is you moralize it. Uh, you come up with with great lessons. You make the, the the heroes moral exemplars of some kind, whether or not they deserve it. Again, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. 
but you can't just presume. But uh, in in scholarship on on the Book of Esther, uh, both in believing and unbelieving scholars, what you find is a lot of hostility toward it. And, and I want to share this with you, not because it's overwhelmingly significant, uh, but because I think you'll find it remarkable just the level of you know, vitriol, really, that there is in some places um, about the book of Esther. So here are some negative reactions. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these. I just want to kind of go through them and, and let you uh, see this because it's a pretty remarkable thing. Martin Luther, who you know very well, says, I'm hostile to es- I'm so hostile to Esther that I wish that it did not exist at all, for it Judaizes too greatly and has much pagan rubbish. And you may, you know, roll your eyes and shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, Martin wanted to just tear all sorts of stuff out of the Bible, um, starting with the book of James. So who cares what he thinks? Uh, but it does represent that kind of, of perspective in some of its its earlier uh, forms. Otto Eisfeld says Christianity has neither occasion nor justification for holding on to it. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, I wish it didn't exist, basically, is what Eisfeld says. Uh, Samuel Sandmel, uh, who is a, a Jewish scholar, says, I should not be grieved if the book of Esther were somehow dropped out of Scripture. Uh, again, I kind of wish it would go away, is Sandemel says, uh, Carl Cornell, valuable as this book uh, is to us as a document for the history of religion and receiving it into the collection of sacred writings, the framers of the canon committed a serious blunder. You talk about something that's remarkable uh, to say is he, he basically comes out and says it doesn't belong in the Bible. And whoever put it in there was wrong. They made a mistake. He says it's an entirely profane story and a purely worldly sense for the sake of satisfying worldly passions and instincts. Alfred Morris, uh, as history, it would be a serious blot upon the character of the Jews. As a historical romance, it condemns only those who delight in its repellent features. So what Morris is saying is either it's true or it's not. Uh, the story itself. If it's true, it's it's awful, and they're awful. If it's not true, then you're awful if you like it, is what it boils down to there. Robert Pfeiffer says that secular nationalism is the book's guiding light. Uh, the author of Esther considered religion a garment to be lightly discarded whenever it hindered worldly aims. He says such a secular book hardly deserves a place in the canon of sacred scriptures. Michael V. Fox, I always have to clarify that middle initial, uh, who's a Jewish scholar as well, uh, it says the lack of reference to God may show that the author did not intend his book to be regarded as sacred scripture. Keep that one in mind, because what I'm going to argue is the author very clearly does intend his book to be regarded as scripture. And I'll, I'll try to make a case for that uh, moving forward. But Fox says that the lack of reference to God may be a clue that he doesn't intend that. Um, three quotes here. Uh, and I have the name at the end and always forget who it is. It's Bernard Anderson it says one gains the impression that the author had an indifferent, if not cynical attitude towards the Jewish religion. Not least of all, the book is inspired by a fierce nationalism and unblushing vindictiveness, which stand in glaring contradiction to the Sermon on the Mount. Surely this is a book of the earth. He says the story unveils the dark passions of the human heart, envy, hatred, fear, anger, vindictiveness, pride, all of which are fused into an intense nationalism. A more human book has never been written. And finally, he says, if a Christian minister is faithful to the context, he will not take his text from Esther. And if the leader of a church school class shows any Christian discernment, he will not waste time trying to show that the heroes of the book are models of character, integrity and piety. So here's someone who's writing from, at least in in some sense, a Christian perspective. I don't know exactly what his denominational persuasion is, um, but from Christendom at large in that most general sense of the word, he's writing from that perspective. And what he's saying is stay away from Esther uh, because there's nothing good that you're going to get out of it uh, at all. Finally, Ernst Bertho says, speaking of Esther, it stands further from the spirit of the Old Testament revelation and the gospel than any other book in the Old Testament. And so there have been some pretty strong reactions to the book of Esther. Um, and I mean, these guys, whatever you think of their conclusions, these aren't idiots that are saying this. Now, they may have said something idiotic, but they themselves, they're not stupid. Um, they're very intelligent people, very well read, very well studied. Uh, they say some incredibly insightful things that I'm not quoting here. You remember what I said last time? How you can make someone look bad just by picking a few things. I may have unintentionally done that with these guys. They, they also say some really incredible stuff that's incredibly helpful. But this is their perspective about the book of Esther from studying it extensively. 
So why then would I make an argument that Esther is to be read in a religious context and that the people in it aren't necessarily the most awful people in the world? And what I want to talk about for most of our, our time here, or at least the rest of our time, is the idea of intertextuality, which is a fancy way of talking about how the book of Esther interacts with the rest of the Old Testament, with the rest of the canon of Scripture. And this is something that is, I think, incredibly important in understanding the book of Esther, both in terms of seeing it as a religious document that the author intended it to be read in a religious context. And also from time to time, uh, these connections will help us understand various things that are going on in the text itself. And so the book of Esther connects with a host of other Old Testament passages. So, for example, there are various places where the book of Esther intersects with the book of of Genesis. And some of these I'll take the time to read. Some of them I won't. And it's probably going to depend some on how that uh, clock ticker keeps moving along uh, because I don't want this to get too terribly long. But beginning in Esther chapter 3 and then comparing that with Genesis chapter 39, uh, there is a, a connection between the stories of Mordecai uh, refusing to bow to Haman and Joseph refusing the advances of Potiphar's wife. Now, when we look at these connections, what we'll see is sometimes there are verbal connections, which is to say the exact same words and phrases are used in both contexts. Sometimes there are thematic connections, which is to say it's the same idea being reflected. And sometimes you've got a little bit of both happening in these. So Esther chapter 3 Verses 2 uh, through 5, all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he refused to listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. And then that's what leads to him wanting to kill uh, Mordecai, but not just Mordecai, all the Jews uh, as well. Uh, Back in Genesis chapter 39, you'll see uh, a couple of verbal connections, exact phrases and words, and uh, a larger thematic connection as well, even though the story is, is quite different. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 6, the latter half of verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern of anything in the house. And he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. And you remember from there, she goes on to concoct this false allegation of his uh, sexual assaulting her attempted rape, which leads to him being thrown into prison, which, by the way, is probably a clue that Potiphar didn't believe his wife. He believed Joseph because that was a capital offense. Uh, Instead of executing Joseph, which he could have, he throws him in the nicest prison, the prison that is under the charge of the captain of the guard who, by the way, is Potiphar. He's the captain of the guard. He's keeping Joseph close to him. Uh, Why is Potiphar so angry? Well, notice the text never says he's angry at Joseph, just that he's angry. I think he's angry at the situation because he's losing the best thing that ever happened to his house uh, in Joseph. But that's a different discussion for a different day. For our purposes, the verbal connections are an appeal day by day and a refusal. So both Joseph and Mordecai are appealed to day by day, and they refuse. Now, obviously, what they're being appealed to about is is very different, uh, but those verbal connections are there. More significant, perhaps, for seeing the parallel is the thematic connection that builds on that verbal connection. Because in both of these cases, what you wind up with are angry, false charges, a bunch of lies, a bunch of lies about Joseph, a bunch of lies about Mordecai and the Jews. Uh, that Haman takes to the king. Angry false charges that take someone who was formerly a trusted Jewish exile. Mordecai is at the king's gate, significant place. Joseph is in charge of everything in Potiphar's house. Angry false charges that, that place a formerly trusted Jewish exile in danger of death. But both of these Jews, 
who are endangered instead become agents of Jewish salvation, who are promoted to a higher position than they ever held before, ultimately second only to the king. The story of Joseph and Mordecai are parallel to one another in terms of being endangered, being uh, on the brink of, of, of possibly dying, ultimately to work their way out of that, to become second only to the king and an agent of salvation to all the Jewish people. And all of it begins for both of them with being appealed to day by day and them refusing. And so it's, it's a pretty remarkable sort of, of connection that's going on there. Another interesting connection is uh, comparing Haman and uh, Joseph uh, since we're in Genesis, or at least since I'm in Genesis, Genesis 41, we'll start there. This, this is a, a reference to um, the, the promotion of Joseph and the honoring that Haman comes up with for himself. And this is a spot where not only do you have the, the parallel, you have something that I think is helpful in understanding just what Haman is doing and how far overreaching he is. Uh, Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 through 45 um, uh, I'll skip down a little bit uh, to verse 42. He took this Pharaoh to Joseph, takes the signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck, made him ride in the second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. And then if you go to Esther chapter 6, where Haman is saying, you know, who would the king want to honor more than me? In verses 6 through 10, uh, he says, uh, picking up in verse 7, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, on whose head is set a royal crown, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse to the square of the city, proclaiming before him, this is what is to be done for the man the king delights to honor. And that's when Ahasuerus says, great, go do that for Mordecai. But what's really striking about it is, is how overreaching this is, because this is uh, th this parallel tells us more about Esther than it tells us about re religion and connection. It tells us what's going on in this story. Notice the contrast between Joseph, who is given a fine linen robe and a gold chain and is put in the second chariot in Egypt, you know, kind of the ancient equivalent of Air Force Two. Um, and uh, a simple command of honor him, it's like one or two words in, in, in the Hebrew, uh, is, is preceded before him. By contrast to that, what Haman asks for is the king's own clothes and the king's own horse and one of the most important people in town going around uh, reading this diatribe out uh, about him. Uh, there is a, a significant difference between Egyptian culture and Persian culture. But one thing is universally true in all of these ancient cultures, and that is that nobody wears the king's clothes but the king. Nobody rides the king's horse but the king. There's a parallel sort of story uh, of Artaxerxes, the son of Ahasuerus, who rewards someone who did something great with a, a piece of clothing of his with the express command that he must not ever wear it. Because to ask for the king's clothes and to ask to ride the king's horse is tantamount to treason is what it is. And this is what Haman's asking for himself. It is, it is a great overreaching. Now, uh, talking about uh, Esther and the book of Exodus, though, I think gives us more of this connection, this religious connection, where we're supposed to read Esther in a religious light. Uh, here, we're not going to take the time to read all of this, obviously, when you see the, the range of, of chapters there. So let me summarize this briefly. When you look at Esther and Moses, you have two Jews who have the privilege of nobility without birthright. They're both in a royal family, even though they have no real reason to be in a royal family, except that through providence they wind up there. Both of them are then forced with a choice where they either stay in that position of comfort or they give up that comfort to identify with their people and intercede with the king. Both of them are hesitant to do so at first. When Mordecai tells Esther, go intercede with the king, she says, ah, I'm not so sure about that. I'm going to die if I try that. Maybe we can come up with another plan is, is kind of uh, the idea there. Moses comes up with every excuse imaginable not to do it. 
Both of them have a life-threatening encounter with the king. Esther might die just when she walks in. Pharaoh tells Moses, the next time I see you, you're a dead man. Uh, both of them uh, find their success when they find favor in the sight of the king. There's a verbal connection there uh, in that phrase. Both of them are strongly connected to Passover. Like I said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Haman's plot is hatched on the eve of Passover. Of course, that's when uh, they're they're getting out of um, of Egypt as well there. So there's a lot of strong connections between Esther and Moses. And likewise, the Feast of Purim and the, the Passover feast, there's a, a lot of, of, of strong connections there uh, as as well. You've got the general Exodus connections. You've got Haman's edict being on the eve of Passover. You've got both stories ultimately being God delivering his people through this Jew with unlikely royal connection. In both cases, you have a precedent setting uh, ritual with the formal legislation that follows. Uh, something happens, they all celebrate, and then the law comes along later saying exactly what to do and how to celebrate. And so that pattern fits uh, as well. But also there are connections between Esther and the prophets. Uh, the, the obvious one, I think, is Esther and the book of Daniel. And here I'll start to move a little bit more quickly so this doesn't go on too terribly long. Um, Esther chapter 2, she is brought in in this uh, dragnet again with all the other virgins. And she hides her identity and uh, she presumably takes the food. We're told that she's given the food of the king unless the, the text is just – blanking totally the idea that she rejects it. I think the presumption is that she's just going along with everything uh, that is, is happening there in chapter two. Uh, that fits her total passivity in chapter two as well. In Daniel chapter one, you've got, again, uh, young Jews in a foreign court, um, and they refuse what's being given to them, at least to some degree they do. So in, in both stories, young Jews in a foreign court with emphasis on ethnicity and food and relationship with the king. Uh, and on the one hand, there is hiding ethnicity. On the other hand, there is uh, emphasizing their ethnicity. And it's two very different things. And this is one of the spots that I, I tend to point to to say that at the outset, I'm not entirely sure that Esther and Mordecai are making the best decisions. Now, this is a judgment call because the text doesn't say one way or the other. And that's, I, I think, something that I, I have to uh, repeat on this. The text is not telling us either way. Whether you say they're being good or whether you say they're not being good, you're reading between the lines because the text offers no evaluation whatsoever on their character. Um, my reading of of this in comparison to Daniel is that Daniel and his friends are the exemplars. They're showing us what should be done in this context. And Esther and Mordecai are falling short by him saying, hide who you are and go along with this whole thing. But again, that's something of a, a judgment call, at least. But you've got this, this connection between those stories. There's also connections between Esther and Jonah and Esther and Joel. And uh, really, there's one point of, of connection in, in all of them. All three of these are places that the who knows question shows up. It shows up a couple of other times uh, in the Bible as well. But uh, Mordecai, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Joel says, who knows, maybe God will forgive you uh, if you repent. Uh, the king of Nineveh in the book of Jonah says, who knows, maybe God will forgive us if we repent. And all of those questions are leaving sovereignty in the hands of God. They're refusing to presume upon him to speak where he hasn't spoken, uh, to, to presume to know what he's going to do. Instead, what you have uh, are these people saying, God is God. Who knows what he'll do? We'll do what we can. Uh, Esther and Joel, also you have fasting and weeping and lamenting, and those three things showing up in the exact same order. Uh, in Esther and Jonah, you've got widespread fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And so you've got that kind of, of connection uh, in these different stories. Probably the one that I think is most interesting is the connection between the Feast of Purim, the celebration of the Jews, uh, the victories uh, that they're having, and the, the return of the exiles at Mount Zion. Uh, so in, in Esther chapter 9, and verse 22, that should say, not verse 2, Esther chapter 9 and verse 22. Um, speaking of their victory, speaking of their celebration, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the months that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into holiday, they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food, 
to one another and gifts to the poor. And so uh, this, this celebration that is happening with their victory. Well, over in Jeremiah chapter 31, you have in this, this short section of Jeremiah 30 and, and uh, a few chapters after that, uh, one of the few bright spots in the entire book. Uh, most of the, the pre-exilic prophets and those that are kind of going through the exile itself, uh, like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, uh, they have a basic message of, you know, you need to repent. If you don't repent, judgment is coming. There's still hope of a future restoration. And really, all they say can be put under one of those headings. Uh, and this hope of a restoration is, is constant. And even in the, the judgment sections, there are hints of this hope of restoration. And usually you'll find at some point, especially in the longer prophets, a really lengthy section talking about the hope of restoration. Not in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is just about unmitigated sorrow all the way through. Uh, it's not quite as bad as Amos in terms of percentage of sorrow all the way through, but it's it's pretty bad. Uh, but you do have this this chunk in the middle here where you've got a hope of restoration. And that's what's being talked about here in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jerusalem has fallen not terribly long ago. Jeremiah has said you're going to be in captivity for some 70 years, uh, but there's going to be a restoration. And part of that restoration he says in Jeremiah 31, 13, is the young women shall rejoice in the dance. The young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. So when the exiles return to Zion, God will turn their mourning into joy and give them gladness for sorrow. When the Jews won their victory in the book of Esther, it was the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. Turn, mourning, gladness, sorrow are all the same words in both of these texts and almost the exact same order. The only one that's different is joy in Jeremiah is replaced with holiday in uh, Esther. And it is focused specifically because of the holiday, the Feast of Purim that is being established there. And the significance of that, the broader significance of that, I think goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is these were Jews who didn't go home. These were Jews who did not return to Jerusalem. And one of the great questions facing these diaspora Jews, as they would come to be called, is, is God still our God too? You know, we didn't go home. How far reaching is his covenant? And the book of Esther, I think, goes a long way to answering that question, that even in Susa, God is still taking care of them. Even in Susa, their mourning is being turned from uh, uh, turned into joy and their sorrow is being turned into gla gladness uh, in, in, in that place. As well. Finally, then, as we've talked about already, there's connection between Esther and Samuel. We talked about this in the last one, so I don't want to belabor the point, but just by way of reminder, um, the the Kishite lineage of Mordecai, the Agagite lineage of of Haman, uh, the Saul uh, King Agag conflict in First Samuel chapter 15, the attempted uh, genocide that happens. Uh, here in the book of Esther in relation to Saul being instructed to wipe out all of the Amalekites, lots of, of connections there. And there are a few more possible connections to Samuel as well. They're not as, as strong. There's one uh, in connection to the, the Nabal Abigail story, but it's, it's not as, as strong of a connection, uh, I don't think. Well, that's uh, what I wanted to, to run through very quickly, those different kinds of connections. Well, what is the, the significance of all of this. Well, remember what, what Fox said uh, back at the beginning, that by leaving God out of the story, the author may have been wanting us to realize he wasn't intending the book to be read religiously. The problem I have with that is that if he didn't want it to be read religiously, why does he echo basically every single part of the Old Testament at one point or another? The book of Esther echoes Genesis and Exodus, and Deuteronomy, and Daniel, and Jonah, and Joel, and Jeremiah, and Samuel, and some others that we didn't go through because they're not as strong of connections, but I think they're probably there as well. The, the point of all of this, in addition to what we can learn from the story, uh, about the story of Esther from comparing it to these other texts that it's connected to, is that it is impossible to read Esther as an irreligious book by the time you're done with this. 
The author wants you to read this book in connection with the rest of the Old Testament. Uh, a more conservative uh, Old Testament scholar named David Firth said it this way, and I think it's very well put, so I don't want to try to improve on what he said. He says, once we realize that so much of the story is told in a way that alludes to other passages in the Old Testament, we begin to realize that our reading of Esther is meant to be shaped by what we know of those other passages. And these allusions are consistently theological in their emphases. We are not seeking God in a text where he is absent. Rather, we are having our understanding of God enriched by the conversation that is generated. And so by setting the, the story squarely in a canonical context, by making it interact with the rest of the Old Testament in this way, that tells us that the coincidences aren't just coincidences, they're providence. It tells us that when Esther talks about fasting, it's not just fasting, it's fasting and prayer, like fasting always goes with prayer. It allows for us to look at statements like, who knows whether you've been put to the, uh, brought to the kingdom for such a time as this, as implicitly speaking about God, even though God is not mentioned. It allows the characters to speak more truth than they know, so that when Haman's wife, Zeresh, says, yeah, if, if he's of the Jews and you're hopeless, um, what does she really know about the Jews? Um, maybe she's heard some stories. Maybe she hasn't. Maybe she's just saying something. But the reality is, like the high priest in the book of John, who spoke far greater truth than he realized, so also does Zeresh. Uh, she doesn't know the great truth that she's speaking when she says, if you stand against God's people, you are utterly hopeless. It is far greater than she realized. And then also, as we talked about last time, by way of conclusion, I'll, I'll bring this to your mind one more time, uh, that when you come to the end of the story, it has implications there. Benjaminite second to pagan Persian as the solution. Well, you have already so thoroughly read the book of Esther in context with the canon that you know that, no, that can't be the solution. What we're looking for is not a descendant of Kish, what we're looking for is the son of David who rule on the throne of eternity, second to no one whose reign will never end. And that's what the book of Esther is working its way toward. Uh, and this intertextuality, as it's called, I think all points us in the direction of seeing God in the story, reading it as a religious text, as it should be read because it's found in the Bible, but not just because it's found in the Bible, because it tells us itself by all these connections that this is indeed a religious book. Well, thank you again for listening. Uh, we've got one more of these lessons to do, and that'll wrap up our study, at least for our purposes, in this summer series on the book of Esther.